Hi, thank you for the lovely introduction, Remy. I'm Ada Rose from um, Samsung Internet. Um, yeah, and I'm here to talk to you about putting the web and, prog and progressive enhancement back into progressive web apps. So, quick summary, who here knows what a progressive web app is? You guys are good. Um, service workers as well? Oh, you guys are amazing, I love this audience. All right, so I think for like probably the three people who didn't raise their hands, um, a progressive web app is, I like to describe it as a website that is so good you want to save it to your home screen. It's, it's, it's fast, it starts quickly, um, it's, you can interact with it um, extremely responsively, like each, each click on the, or tap on the page or immediately start an interaction. The, um, it will work offline. You can have an icon on the home screen and you've usually kind of replaced some of, the, some of the default web styling with some beautiful styling of your own to give it a really native feeling. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's kind of a nice pattern that's been around for quite a few years, but it's really been really starting to take off in the last couple. But the other thing I'd like to touch on is progressive enhancement because it's, it's important to build websites which not just work for the latest, but also work for browsers um, which haven't been around for a, for a long time. Um, so yeah, I was going to. So yeah, here's an example of a progressive web app. Um, so, but not only building websites which work on past browsers, but also using features which aren't available everywhere yet and, and building for future browsers. And I think all that comes under the umbrella term of progressive enhancement. Is that finished yet? Oh yes, yeah, so that's just added to the home screen and it's lost all the browser interface. So when you're trying to deliver content through a web app or just through a website, your content probably looks a bit like this. It's text and videos, <laughs> images, audio. Um, usually, like, the stuff which is very well supported in the web. And you can deliver this stuff to, to many browsers of going back for a long time and all of this will work. But some of the stuff which may not work is the context around your content. So this is your styling, your scripts. Um, this is, um, what else have I got up there? Oh yeah, so um, um, some of the more advanced layout features. So grid as uh, mentioned by the previous speaker. Um, Flexbox isn't available on, on some of the very old, very old browsers. Um, and this is the kind of thing which, which you can be robust for, but it's okay if they're not working. So progressive web apps add a bunch of stuff for introducing a, a native-like context to your app or to your website. So this, this includes technologies like service workers and the web app manifest to allow you to describe how a website looks when it's placed on the home screen. So by, but this, oh yeah, these technologies won't be available everywhere. But you, if you, by embracing progressive enhancement and accepting that that's, this is the case, you can build a web app which works extremely well on devices which support, support these new features. But where they're not supported, you're still going to have a great web experience. So this is the, this is the key, key feature of the web. It's extremely wide-reaching, huge audience, huge variety of devices. This particular slide is extremely, extremely overused, but it, yeah. I think every time someone talks about progressive enhancement, they bring up this quote but it's extremely apt because um, when you have as many devices on the web as, as there are, the long tail of support is, 
going to be very long indeed. So as long as your content, which does have this, this which does support on, even on the lowest devices, or at least has fallbacks to show additional content, um, then you can, um, you can really make sure everyone gets your message, and that's the important thing of the web. So why, aside from old browsers, why might a browser not get your content? So, yeah. It's, um, some browsers will have reduced features not because they can't, but because the browser himself has turned them off, perhaps due to the user's accessibility needs, or um, perhaps the, the, the platform it's on is actually missing features required to use them. For example, you could, have, um, you could access the web without a screen through a braille reader. There's lots of, um, lots of reasons why the way we experience the web is not the same for everybody. This is part of the reason why it's called a user agent, because the, the browser acts on our behalf to pull down content, and it interprets it according to our needs, which is um, a very, um, which is a, a hard concept to embrace, I think, because when we build something, we see what it looks like on our machines without really thinking about what other devices are out there so much. So this leads me on to the difference between um, really native content and web content. And this is, web content is declarative. It's meant to be interpreted as opposed to native content, which is programmatic. So the real difference here is that a programmatic content, you know the platform you're going to be running it on. So, so you don't anticipate for stuff to break, and when does stuff does break, it tends to break catastrophically. <coughs> so, if, um, so if you're ever running a JavaScript and one of the functions you're relying on hasn't arrived, like it's, it's fallen off the network or, or it's just not available on that browser, sometimes your script will just end right there, which, is, which can leave your content totally stranded. Whereas if you embrace um, the interpreted semantic web, um, your, your HTML will still work regardless of whether your CSS files or JavaScript came down. Because, actually, quick show of hands. So who here has been on the train, loaded up a web page, and, and only had the HTML arrive? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, the line from um, Clapham to Staines says 4G. It ain't 4G. <laughs> so yeah. So the other advantage of interpreted content you can, you can write something and build it and ship it, and it works on devices and formats which didn't even exist when, that, when your page was written. So when you build um, embracing HTML and, and like CSS, you can build something which will last long into the future. But not only that, you can build using um, standards which have only been around for a very short amount of time and implemented on only a couple of browsers and, and expect them to gain support as, as technology moves on without you having to ship any additional code. Of course, um, you have to accept that you're losing power here as a developer because you, you can't dictate how your content is interpreted anymore. It's, it's left up to the browser, to the user agent. They might have extensions to rewrite content, to, to swap out fonts with different fonts for accessibility. They might be blocking tracking. They could be um, preventing GIFs from loading um, because animated content makes them ill. 
there are many reasons why, um, why you can't dictate the precise experience. But if you, if you can accept that and give up that power, you'll build something that works for a wide variety of people on a wide variety of devices for a very long time. Of course, you can still take power back if you want to. You can use JavaScript to rewrite a whole bunch of web features. Please don't. Um, but with great power comes great responsibility. And when it comes to that, remember to, to, to re-implement what the web, um, um, what the web gives you. And the web has a lot of features built in, which is, um, which is when new standards come along, these features are focused on when standards are written. So because the web is built on standards, it can be quite slow to evolve. Um, because there are lots of very, very clever, but extremely stubborn people in standards bodies. And they have very strong goals in mind for maintaining um, the abilities of the web for um, security and privacy of the end user. So these are stuff which, which native doesn't have to worry about so much because it's a single platform. Mm -hmm. And they can, they can choose as they want what to do. But in the web, security and privacy for everyone is extremely important. The web is, by default, mostly accessible. You can make it better, um, but by default, it, it takes you 95% of the way there just by writing HTML and CSS. And this is something which is always kept in mind when new features are released, because we can't, we can't build the web for the majority of people. We build the web for everybody. So on top of that, because these standards take a long time to produce. We don't want to have to produce a new standard every time a new way of working comes out. So by making the web extensible, when people do find new ways of working, they can take advantage of this ex extensibility to, to introduce new features and new ways of working based on already existing technology. Um, so just wondering, who here has heard of the extensible web manifesto? Ah, cool, more than yesterday. Um, you guys are the cool guys. Um, um, if you haven't, check it out. It's worth the read. It kind of, a lot of people making standards kind of buy into it, and it's, um, and it's making the web very future-proof. Um, check, definitely check it out. So implementability. So if you made all these lovely standards, can you actually build them into the browser? Because browser manufacturers know how their browser is built. And sometimes a feature would be really lovely, but it just doesn't work in the current model of the browser. Um, so often this feedback might cause um, something to take a long time, or at least be delayed until, until the browser is in a state when it could be in introduced. And that goes. Um, straight into performance as well, because sometimes a feature can be put in, but it's not going to be done performantly. And the web isn't run on just expensive laptops and high-end phones. It's run on low-end phones, really old computers. It's like on many schools and prisons and places um, not in the first world, in our homes and our pockets as, <laughs> as developers in the Western world. It's it's got to run all over the place. So that's, um, so preventing developers from shooting themselves in the foot with regard to performance is, yeah, very important feature. So yeah, the web is built to last, but you don't have to, um, you don't have to just build for the future. <coughs> By making use of standards now, you can, you can build something which will, work for 50% of users now, but in two years will work for 98% of users. Because many browsers are evergreen. People will receive the updates when they arrive. So you don't have to wait for every feature to be supported everywhere. And that's kind of the loveliness that comes with embracing progressive enhancement. 
Of course, there has been some issues with trying to use new features before they come, they come live. The fiasco around um, prefixed CSS um, and prefixed JavaScript um, methods and properties has led to a state where um, browsers have had to have to implement prefixes from other browsers just to get them working. So, for example, like um, WebKit transform, I'm pretty sure works in Edge, which was a very bad state to be in. So, browser pr browser providers are generally moving away from um, prefixed um, browser prefix notations because if you if you show developers something shiny they will try to use it even if it's going to break in the future. So, um, so now I, my recommendation here is wait for a feature to be adopted by two or, two or more browsers and then it's probably safe to use it, even if those two or, brow two or more browsers don't have a huge market share. So, um, Here's a question, who here knows how to write HTML? So a few of you, that's good. Um, yeah, HTML was designed to be human readable and human writable. It's how many developers get started. I myself started learning how to develop because I was changing my MySpace page. And it gets a lot of people started in the web. And it's not something, and I think if we can, um, if we start making the web, which is um, totally divorced from these fundamental principles, we're going to start losing the next generation of developers who are finding it difficult to get started in building the web. Because if the very first thing you do is find out what your terminal is and start working out um, what Node is and Gulp or Grunt, and, and download a whole bunch of libraries before you can even start producing some content, then it's a very sad, sad state for, for new developers. So performance. So performance is something which is, the web gets you by default, generally, because standards are made so that we can maintain this performance. And if you're scrolling around on Wikipedia, you will scroll at 90 frames, uh, 60 frames per second, both 90 if you're in a VR browser. Um, um, yeah, you'll scroll around at 60 frames per second with very little jankiness because there's not a lot going, um, going on in terms of scripting. And the browser goes through great lengths to cache what it can and to make, the, make it as fast as possible. Of, and it's one of the things that's very, very easy to break. But as well as animation performance, there's also network performance. So HTML is designed to, to render progressively, to, to show you content before the rest of the page is loaded. So there's a web page out there which has every single HTML spec on it, the, every single um, yeah, W3C spec. It's, it's many megabytes in size. But you can, you can click on the link to that page and start reading it in a few seconds because even though your browser hasn't downloaded the whole thing in a few seconds, you've only downloaded maybe the first few hundred K, you can start reading it straight away. And this is something that's very easy to throw away and, but is extremely powerful and comes for free. So responsively designed. So this is something which has been a major theme of, of many talks for a long time. And is something which, by embracing it, you can ship the same content to many devices. And, and giving the content to a, a wide audience as possible, it's, it's very webby. So yeah, building stuff responsibly designed is kind of built into the web already. Like, Websites still work if they were built before 2008, when people started really getting into responsive design. They still work on mobile phones. You can still use them. It's, the, it's, yeah, it's just one of those things that works. And it's something which you can improve on a lot with CSS. So, um, yeah, I'll get into more of that a bit later. 
My other, one of my other favorite web features is that the web works for everyone everywhere. So aside from a few media companies, most content made in any part of the world can be accessed from any other part of the world. A developer who, who is just getting started is on equal footing as Google and Facebook with regards to uh, accessibility to their content. The web is extremely democratic with regards to both accessing and curating content. So by embracing this and ensuring your content does work anywhere, you might find new, new audiences you never expected to have before, which I think is a beautiful thing. So who here knows what to do with a URL? Oh, not many of you, it seems. Okay, well, what you do, you copy it and you paste it into the URL bar of your browser and you press return or the go button on your phone and then it loads it. So it's this cool thing called the World Wide Web. Check it out, it's really good. I think it's gonna catch on. Um, so yeah, I'm being joking. Everyone knows what to do with the URL. Like, you can, you can put a URL on a post-it or send it to someone on Twitter. You can text it to someone. You can stick it on a carrier pigeon. Like, URLs are a powerful pattern. Um, and progressive web apps give you the ability to hide the URL of your current page, which means that people don't know how to share it as, it, as instinctively before. Because people have been sharing web pages for, well, as long as there have been web pages, about 25 years now. It's like, it's, it's something which you've probably embraced and make sure the URLs you're actually putting out there kind of make sense and they're not just like some UUID in the top so that people can see it, they know approximately what they're gonna get and they can click on it and share it. And by, by keeping access to, to your content, to, well, to the URL to your content from your, from your web app experiences, you can help people share. And fortunately, this is something which you can't throw away, which is security. The web provides you a lot of security measures by default. There's been a huge push to move to HTTPS now. And if, uh, with tools like um, um, Let's Encrypt, and they've done some really great work there, they provide um, um, certificates for HTTPS for free. You can use services like Cloudflare just to stick it in front of your service if you, if you don't feel comfortable implementing HTTPS in your website. Um, and it gives you access to a whole bunch of shiny new browser features. So the ability to go offline and with service workers, um, the um, GPS APIs are now um, only available on HTTPS. It's something which, which if you just go on HTTPS, you, you give a level of trust to your users, which is a very powerful thing. But also, there are ways to add additional security on top of that. So if you provide a content security policy, you can, you can reduce the risk of cross-site scripting attacks on your server or people putting in um, malicious content to try and um, um, fool your users into doing something bad. So this is, um, if, if you're, if you're building a site, definitely, I said, which, which can take third-party content, definitely recommend ch checking out getting a CSP because it will, um, or s implementing the con a content security policy because it will greatly improve the security of your website. So the web works. It's been around for a long time. This is the first web page. It still works. It's still there. Um, and it will still work 25 years down the line, 250 years down the line, if, if we're still, um, if HTML is still a thing. Hopefully it is, because um, content is made to be, HTML content is made to be archived. And you can access sites which have long since fallen off the internet and the servers have shut down through the archive. And I'm worried in this world of, um, programmatic websites that, that in, in many years, when that JavaScript is, is broken, 
that there's just going to be this big blank spot in 2015, 2016, 2017, where half the, half the websites just don't work anymore. All of the links just go to a hash URL um, because they're not triggering anything on the JavaScript. And I think that would be a really sad state of affairs to be in. Of course, some HTML features also get de deprecated. But HTML is, is progressive enhanced by default. So I'm, so I'm sorry those of you relying on the blink tag. But your site still works. That content that was before blinking now just isn't blinking. But the content is still available. So when we, when we deprecate features of the web, we try not to break the web as a whole, because breaking the web is not something we do. Of course, you're welcome to throw it all away and build it all with JavaScript. Um, the power is yours to do that. That is another good feature of the web. So although there is all this built-in web, web loveliness, you don't have to use it. But when you do start re-implementing um, various web features um, with JavaScript in order to get some additional functionality, just think about all these things you're throwing away and make sure you re-implement them for the future, especially accessibility. That's extremely important. So how did native apps pull all this content away from the web? So there was this, um, there was this thing that came out um, in um, a few years ago, well, about 10 years ago now, um, called a smartphone. Some of you may have one. Um, uh, and it really changed the way which, um, in which we saw the web. Because the web was no longer a platform you access through a desktop computer. The web was something you could access from anywhere in the world, but on a different format. So the first thing they did when they realized the web was on a different format was that we kind of cut it off from the web. And we started trying to push different content to different users, either by redirecting to some MDOT website where they would receive entirely different content, usually not what they were looking for. Or we would throw up an interstitial and tell them, yeah, you don't want this content. You want our app. And this, both of these patterns really trashed user engagement and trust in the web. It's kind of left this taint on the mobile web, which is still there today, when people aren't expecting to get the same content on mobile as they are on their desktop. And although the image is getting better with the responsive design, um, which has been implemented since, we still need to work on building this trust up back in the mobile web. And one of the ways websites have done that is by throwing away everything that looks remotely webby. So if you, instead of building a website by building a single page web app where, where each interaction happens immediately, it, um, it, brings, it brings this native feel to the web. But we actually realized we actually kind of like this in the web. Like, it really worked well for users. It, it improved engagement. Um, it allowed users to, um, to have a native experience without needing to download anything beforehand, which was very powerful. And out of that kind of came, oh yeah, sorry, there's a fun slide for that. I love this at KCD. It's the one I always include somewhere. Um, Yeah, so we, um, um, the ability to add, add webs websites to our home screen really changed the way we thought about the web as a platform, that perhaps the web could be something more than something you interact with through a browser. So what could native do that, that people started um, using it to, instead of the web. Like, so why did, um, um, why did developers suddenly decide 
the web is no longer the good place to put my content. Because that's before, before, that was the way you would deliver your news content or your media content of any kind. Well, I asked this at uh, MozFest last week, and I got quite a few answers back. So here's just a few of them. That the web, the, that native apps integrate smoothly into the device's user interface. They can be offline and work wherever the user is. They can do push notifications to re-engage users. They're performant. They can have an icon on the home screen. And, and you, can, you can sell them and do, um, do transactions through them. So I'd like to think that all of you here know that all the things I listed above can be done in the web. They're not web-exclusive features, but this is the image that the native has in comparison to the web. And this is the image we've got to promote in the web itself by building great content. For Sellable, I'd like to um, just mention there's new web payment APIs to allow you to do um, payments in the web without relying on third-party providers. Which, um, which I think is going to see a real drive of um, new media content in the web when people can start um, selling their content much more easily, which I think is a fantastic thing. So how do you actually integrate um, a web app with your, with your device's user interface? So you can use a web app manifest file. Uh, there's one behind me um, for my app, for my pet project. Um, this, um, this allows you to um, describe the app-like um, de description of your website. So how the icon on the home screen looks, the background color when you bring it up, the, um, the color the, of the status bar or the various theme features the operating system should use to integrate your, your app with it. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of cool. And I'm going to talk about bringing your, the app offline. So this is, this is the web as it, yeah, this is, yeah, this is the web as it used to look. You'd have a page inside a browser accessing the network for all its content. When we added the ability to add the home screen, we add, add a web app to our home screen, we kind of took it out of the browser and removed the browser interface. When service workers came along, we added the ability to intercept and rewrite any network request. We could provide cached content or make entirely new content from scratch. It's a very, very powerful API that I think we're only beginning to scratch the surface of some of the patterns that can be accomplished with it. But aside from being powerful in its own right, it also brings in um, new APIs that can be attached to it for when we want to work with the web outside of the context of a web browser. So for example, push notifications allow you to engage with your user without them having to unlock their phone or, 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 um, or bring up a web browser or open your app, which is a very powerful pattern. It also allows you to do entirely new layers of progressive enhancement. So although all these features are progressive enhancements of their own, like a website um, doesn't need necessarily need to rely on them to work, it also introduces the idea of the network, the very network itself being a progressive enhancement. So you don't have to rely on the, on the phone being offline, and you can build a very robust experience. And when, when users start to realize that your site works offline, they will start using your website on the train between Clapham and Staines. Because they know they're not reliant upon any kind of network or anything to get the content down. They can just build it, they can just use it and, and experience your content regardless of whether they're online or not. 
And that's going to really increase the way they engage with, the web, with your website. Because then they're not expecting um, to have to wait or, um, or until they get to a station to pull any content down. So one image the, the web has is that it ha it's not performant, which is a shame because the web can be performant and it can be performant by default. So um, when you're loading a page on the web, it doesn't feel instant because you, you, push, you push your link and the page may go white for a few seconds and the new content will come in. Even when you've got a service worker caching all your pages, it, although it will be very quick, it still won't quite feel instant, especially if it has to do stuff like, um, like re-add your web fonts or stuff like that. So the single, um, the single page web app pattern is actually very, very powerful here. And there are a ton of frameworks <laughs> for making single page web apps. There's a lot out there. Um, and they um, allow you to do stuff like, um, like present dummy content for when, um, so you can give a really fast feeling of interaction without actually having to, um, without having to reload the page. They can, they tap the link and something happens, even if it does have to make a full network request, you have a, f you have a few hundred milliseconds of when you're doing something to actually get that content down. Unfortunately, um, they can be not that robust on the network. Some frameworks require you to download um, several hundred kilobytes of JavaScript before anything loads. And if you're one of those people who raise the hand where I've asked, have you ever received a website which is just HTML? This is a situation where that content won't work for you at all. So if you can, I'm not saying never use JavaScript on a web page, but perhaps consider shipping down the minimum amount possible for the situation where your website does cut off loading partway through. So there's a, there's a pattern which the, um, the Chrome developer relations people are really pushing, which I really agree with, called purple, where the idea is that you you put down the minimum content you need to actually get something displayed to the user and you render it. You can then start caching any additional resources for further usage and start building a progressive web, so I'll start building a web app experience around the user and keeping all these cached. And then any further um, clicks the user or interactions the user has will be very quick. And anything more than that, you can just lazy load it as they're needed. Um, because all the interactions themselves will already be quick. So progressive web apps are really cool. I really like them. But you do make some sacrifices when you use one in comparison to just having a website. So you actually, in discarding the browser UE, you're taking away some of the power from the user. They can't access their extensions anymore or their history. They may not be able to see the URL bar. So it might be wise to restore some of this power, perhaps add forward and back buttons to your progressive web app. Do some way to share the content or expose the URL. Um, the new sharing APIs will make um, sharing content um, even easier and will work really well without having a progressive web app. So in summary, think webby but feel native. Embrace progressive enhancement to break gracefully and prepare for the future. Don't be siloed. If I start seeing pwa.websites, <laughs> yeah, don't do that, because then we're just going back to 2007. The, we've learned our hard lessons then. Start having the progressive web app content be on the mobile, have the same content added to the home screen, have it available on the desktop. Don't break accessibility. I know you all love your shiny JavaScript frameworks, but make sure they work for everybody. You could even add additional um, um, features to make it to 
add improved keyboard interactions, which will greatly improve the accessibility for everyone, and it's something you should definitely test before you ship your product. And by embracing progressive enhancement, we, you'll build a website which will last long into the future. And by building a website that will last, together we will build a web that will last. Thank you.